the Namaqua Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I'm trying to get my speaker view. There we go. And if everyone except Elizabeth would please uh, mute themselves, it would be very helpful to um, keeping this service uh, as auditory as possible. Elizabeth and I are doing this service um, as a recap of what we learned and what we were inspired to look into by the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly this year. Today, Chad Escalier is our Zoom technician. To improve the quality of sound, he was gonna mute everybody, but some of you, it looks like, need to mute yourselves. And we will um, keep microphones muted, except during the joys and sorrows and um, when we ask visitors right now, if they wanna say hello, if this is your first time coming to our virtual service. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> How'd you hear of us? Uh, I, I'm Chad's father. Terrific. Oh, great. Hi, great Chad's father. Hi. Great to have you. I'm going to mute now. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Sure. Anyone else here for the first time? Okay. Um, this is the first in a series of services about the um, delving deeper into the topics of GA this past year. Um, each year, the General Assembly has a focus uh, for social justice. And this year, the focus was Indigenous people of the Americas. Now, as Elizabeth and I planned this service, we were eager to uh, honor Indigenous people and Indigenous traditions by incorporating some of them into our service. Uh, we were also wary of doing that because we um, don't want to be inappropriately appropriating pieces of cultures that we're not part of. And, and those cultures that have been oppressed by the dominant culture, which we are a part of. So I did talk with a friend of mine who is Iroquois Mohawk. She calls herself Haudenosaunee to uh, double check on what felt okay to her. She does a lot of cultural competence uh, workshops. So be, please bear in mind as we worship together this morning that we are um, cautiously honoring the people of indigenous people of the Americas by using a few of their traditions. Okay, we are going to light the chalice. We light this chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism in tandem with UU congregations across the country. And the land acknowledgement. We meet on the traditional home of two closely allied nations, the Cheyenne and the Arapaho people, whose names for themselves are Satai, Sutayo, Sisita, when entering sacred space, many indigenous people first call on the spirits of each of the cardinal directions to create what Black Hawk of the Lakota Nation called the sacred hoop. Today, we will honor this tradition by calling the traditional names of creator deities of various nations to the south, east, north and west of us. Powers of the South, Nanishta, creator god of the Choctaw, who call themselves the Chata Anumpa, we call on you to join us in the sacred space this morning. Powers of the East, Raweno, creator god of the Iroquois nation, who call themselves the Honanashoni, we call on you to join us in this sacred space this morning. Powers of the North, Anguta, creator god of the Eskimo, who call themselves the Inuit, 
we call on you to join us in this sacred space this morning. Boyope, the creator, god, and trickster of the Miwok people who call themselves Koka, we call on you to join us in this sacred space. Power of the center. Kichaba Nihata, creator god of the Arapaho people who call themselves the Hitin Nino Eno, whose land we meet on, we call you to join us in the sacred space this morning. Um, let us worship together. We bring you a poem by the uh, indigenous hey, American- I'm sorry, Francie, I think we're doing the- um... Oh, Mary Youngblood first? Yeah, please okay, enjoy thanks. this music by Mary Youngblood playing the flute. Good point. Francie, you're muted. I'm new to this. I'm new here. Um, and now we're going to bring you a poem by Native American poet Joy Harjo that was uh, featured in the uh, UU General Assembly in June. Remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the star's stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to night. 
Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are the earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is, remember. Our young people are so important to us and we make sure they're included in our service in this time for all ages. These stories may also remind some of us with more life experience of what's important to keep in our minds and hearts as we make this journey. Today, we'll listen to a reading of a Cheyenne story, Star Stories, Quill Work Girl and Her New Seven Brothers. Have you ever seen the Big Dipper up in the sky? This is the Cheyenne story of how it came to be. There was once a girl known for her handiwork. She made beautiful embroidery decorated with porcupine quills. The people in her village knew her as Quill Work Girl. Quill Work Girl had no brothers and no suitors. So everyone was surprised when, out of the blue, she started making clothing for a man. It took her a whole month to sew and decorate the outfit, and when she was done, it was magnificent. But Quill Work Girl wasn't finished. She sewed and embroidered six more sets of clothing, including one small outfit for a boy. What are you planning to do with these clothes, her mother asked. Quillwork Girl told her that she was going to live far away with seven brothers. Don't be sad, she said. One day you will see me again with my brothers and you will be very proud. So the girl packed up the clothing and left her village in search of her new life. Finally, she came to a river. On the other side, she saw a little boy I've been waiting for you, said the boy. You are going to be my sister. The little boy loved his new clothes and his new sister. I have six older brothers, he told her, and when they come home from hunting, they are going to be very pleased to see you. Just as the little brother predicted, the brothers were overjoyed with their new sister. The clothes she had made for them and the delicious dinner she cooked. They all lived together happily until one day a bison calf appeared at the teepee. We've heard about the wonderful new sister who has come to live with you, he said, and we want her for ourselves. The little brother said no and told the bison to leave. Bigger and bigger bison came with the same request, but the little brother turned them all down. We will never give our sister away, he said. Then one day they heard a thunderous pounding of hooves. Old bull, the biggest and fiercest bison of all, was on his way. Do something, Quillwork girl begged her little brother. He pulled out his bow and shot an arrow into a nearby tree. The tree began to grow toward the sky 
and the girl and her seven brothers jumped into its branches just in time. But old bull was very strong. He butted his big head against the tree and the tree began to sway. Little brother shot another arrow into the tree and it grew even higher. Just as the tree began to fall, Quill Work Girl and her brothers jumped from the branches into the sky and became stars. They are still there today. Close to one of the big stars is a tiny star. That's the little brother and his beloved sister walking hand in hand. Together we are weaving a tapestry of love we call community. To do this, we take time each Sunday to share some of the important joys and sorrows in our personal lives. Acknowledging that this community joins with you to celebrate your personal joys and offers you comfort for your personal sorrows. If you'd like to share, please use the chat function to send your name to me and I will call on you. To use chat, Put your cursor on the bottom of your screen, click on chat, and type in your name. You can also share your joy and sorrow by writing in the chat box. Please be brief and know that all of us will have an opportunity to share more during our virtual coffee hour after this service. To begin, does anybody have a birthday or a life milestone that would like to share? If anybody's waving and I can't see you, if somebody else could tell me. <laughs> okay, Pete and Jen, what would you like to say? My chat's not showing up. Oh, there we go. No. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask our congregation to send good thoughts to the universe. My brother is getting a kidney transplant tomorrow and my niece is donating the kidney. Wow. So um, we are all sort of on pins and needles about this event that has been looming at us for many years. Thing. Thank you very much to whoever it was that uh, went out and washed the uh, front of the church the other day. Uh, it looks great. <laughs> Anybody else have a joy or sorrow? Or, yeah, I guess joy or sorrow, we're on both. Birthdays, milestones, joy or sorrow. Well, I'm going to share. I do have a birthday this week. I turned 48. And on a more concerning note, Elaine and I evacuated uh, yesterday and the day before because of the fires. So if you could keep us in your thoughts. Dee had a joy, Elizabeth. Let's see. Dee. I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm grateful Elizabeth and um, Elaine were able to safely evacuate. And Norma and Vicki are saying they are grateful for the moisture in the air today as well, echoing your concern, Dee. Okay, am I missing anybody? Oh, Kent, go ahead, just un unmute yourself, Kent. Is that okay? Yep. All right. Uh, we got a letter, my wife and I, that said uh, uh, on January 2021 that, um, that the company uh, that works with AERP will be dropping the company that my wife is in, the uh, nursing center, and uh, we might have to find another company or maybe we can get uh, a discount uh, and it won't be as bad, but at first it scared me that uh, she might have to move.
but it, it turned out later that everybody in that um, uh, rehab nursing center, rehab nursing center of the Rockies, uh, will be uh, losing the AARP group that they're in, but that there may be another group or the co original cost may not be that bad. So it put some panic and some stress in our lives, but hopefully it's gonna turn out better. Monday, I'll talk to the agent and uh, we'll see how it turns out. Okay. Hi, this is Atulia. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Can you, I have two new dogs now and here they are. Can you see the video is working? Is your video on? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, congratulations on your dogs. I saw them, they're adorable. <laughs> we do have some chat messages um, from Sunderland. Liz, I'm not quite sure that, what? Angela wrote this actually. And okay, Angela. Uh, an update for return to school. My return will be November 9th. Liz returns this week. Good thoughts to her as she re-enters the workplace to remain healthy. From yeah. Doris, thinking of friends whose neighborhood was hit by Cameron Peak fire yesterday. They are safe, but waiting to hear if they lost their home. Um, let's see. And from Susan Moody, Oh, I'm thinking of you and Elaine. Sorry, that was private. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to say, can I, I'm happy to have Elaine staying with me. I'm uh, sorry that she has to leave her home, but we also have her chickens and her cats. So that's a bonus too. But let's hope that um, people, their homes are saved and that they can get back safely. Yeah. All right, is there anything else today that I'm missing? Where do these, where does Elaine and Elizabeth live? Out on Glade Road, past Devil's Backbone. What's the name of the road again? Glade. Glade. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll put some more pebbles in for the joys and sorrows that remain in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts. Okay, now we're gonna to listen to some music, uh, traditional music by three young Mayan men from Central America. And I said, piece that I think- it We need to light the lights for the joys and sorrows beyond Namaqua. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll listen to the music by three young Mayan men. Uh, I personally think it's a really fun piece, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
That was beautiful. Nice choice, Elizabeth. As we were preparing for this service, I was reflecting on my history with the history of Native American people. And I've been fascinated by the idea of indigenous people since I was a child. The first things I learned about them gave me the idea that they were like a fantasy people. Think of the natives in Peter Pan Neverland. I thought they were a sweet people who didn't have real houses, wore loincloths and walked silently through the woods without cracking any twigs. I tried my best to avoid twigs, but I was always pretty noisy when I was walking through the woods. The natives I learned had taught their infants not to cry so they could be silent on the trails. And they did this by holding their mouths and noses closed when they did cry. So I tried to do my aunt a favor and teach my baby cousin not to cry by holding her mouth and nose. And luckily my mom noticed and probably saved the baby's life or at least saved her from brain damage. Then in, in elementary school, we made a map of Michigan where, we, where I lived and wrote on it the names of the groups of people who had lived in various areas before us. There was no mention about where those people had gone. And I figured they had just died natural deaths as my ancestors came on the scene. Imagine my surprise when a group of indigenous people, Indians, put on a little fundraising fair in the town where I usually spent the summer. Indians were real life people. They wore the same kind of clothes as I did. They spoke English. But my mom explained that there weren't very many of them and they were all poor and really of little account. Meanwhile, her father, my grandfather, told us that we were all part Sioux, which seemed great to me. My real education about indigenous people began when I took classes in the Native American Studies Department at the um, UC Berkeley. In the Native American history class, I learned that the names of the various indigenous people are not what they called themselves. The uh, explorers of European descent would ask people they came upon, who are those people over there? Who are the people in the next village? The Ojibwe said, oh, those are the Sioux, which means little snakes in Ojibwe language. Or Arapaho, which means the people you can't understand. I learned how the white Americans did all they could to contain, eliminate indigenous people, including a call from President Andrew Jackson to kill them all. In my anthro-linguistics class, I learned how varied indigenous languages are and that the largest body of cultural studies done by settler colonialists are studies of native languages. I even got a chance to learn some Lakota language before the native speaker, uh, from a native speaker in a class which ended too soon. All I remember is that means my headaches and my nose is chapped. When I learned that the social justice theme of this year's Unitarian Universalist General Assembly was help for and walk accompaniment of indigenous people, I jumped at the opportunity to learn more. One of the speakers at GA was Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She has written an indigenous people's history of the United States. Hearing her speak and reading her well-documented book was eye-opening to me. When the English, French, and Dutch arrived on the Northeast coast of what is now the United States, the people they met were not the scantily clad nomads I pictured in my childhood. These people had not only formed the Six Nation Confederacy of the Iroquois, which they called the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, they had established villages 
with an approximately six mi square miles of cultivated farmland surrounding each village. The crops grown in these fields had originated in present day Mexico through networks of trails and roads, differing indigenous people adopted the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. These were farmed extensively in all of North America, formed a healthy, complete protein, which was supplemented with occasional meat from game animals. The Europeans looked down on the indigenous people for not domesticating and breeding animals. Instead, the indigenous people on the East Coast practiced game management by creating meadows in the forests where game animals came to feed. So they knew where to find uh, meat when it was needed. Their practice of game management rather than domestication and breeding strikes me as a much more humane source of food than our agribusinesses and fetid feedlots. There's also evidence of trade among indigenous people that spanned from the Aztecs and sent down to Central America and across what is now the Southwest of the United States and on, on up to what is now Canada. Turquoise was mined in the area currently called New Mexico and Arizona. It was used as currency from Central America all the way to Canada. Indigenous cultures influenced each other in many other ways as well. Spiritual practices of distinct groups of indigenous people were also influenced by neighboring cultures, just as they were in Europe. Most of the indigenous cultures were governed through consensus rather than majority rule. This collaborative form of government frustrated the early settler colonialists who wanted to make deals with a man or two who could represent all the people. They wanted to speak to the men who led the war parties and the hunting parties rather than to a woman who might have been running the economy for the city states. So these are the wild Indians who the settler colonialists of Europe came upon beginning in 1492, surging in the 1600s and culminating in the near destruction of indigenous cultures in America. Indigenous people living today have survived genocide, removal from their homelands and the severe attacks on their governments and cultures. I remember a few weeks ago uh, when Janet Gillette was leading the service, she mentioned that somebody ought to rewrite the history of the United States. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has done that from the perspective of the indigenous people. If I had gotten nothing else from GA this year, I would be satisfied to have opened my eyes further about the history and cultures that preceded us on this land. Currently, some are struggling and some are vibrant. All are important for getting a full picture of our ancestors' place in history and of our heritage as Americans. Okay, it's time for our offering. We will be doing that virtually. One of the ways Namaqua walks our talk is to give half of our collection plate a way to support our local community. This month, we will donate half of our collection to Alternatives to Violence. Alternatives to Violence provides shelter, advocacy, education, and resources for people impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. In this time of greater isolation, those living with an abusive partner are at greater risk and help may be harder to find. The agency's services are more important now than ever. To donate, click on the chat icon. Chat will display a link that invites you to give. Just click on the link to give you an electronic donation, either with your bank card or by credit card. You can choose to designate your donation as a pledge for the collection plate or for our building fund. 
Alternatively, you can always mail in your donation to the church or go to our website to donate electronically. During this time, please enjoy the music of the Onondaga Youth at the United Nations. Amy Killen. I have my own medical practice and I've been using Doodly now for a few weeks to Amy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We dedicate ourselves and these are offerings to the vision of this congregation, which is to radiate love, peace, and justice within and beyond these walls. Oops, oh, we offered a lot of pens. Growing up, I wasn't, I was aware of indigenous cultures, but they weren't a part of my community of what I saw on a daily basis. I was lucky enough later in life to go spend time with indigenous cultures for just about two years down in Honduras. Um, and I, right now I'm looking forward to spending some time with either Quechua, Aymara, Shuar down in Ecuador. But I've never really learned uh, much about the indigenous cultures in the United States until I moved upstate New York, which is home to the Iroquois Confederacy. So my talk today is entitled Recognizing Indigenous Cultures. Our society overlooks the presence of indigenous cultures. Therefore, we're often unaware of the indigenous culture traits. We don't always recognize as some of those traits have contributed to the culture that has shaped us. We lack an appreciation and thorough understanding for the awesome complexity and beauty of indigenous cultures. I'm not an expert on indigenous cultures, but today I would like to highlight three cultural complexes that made an impression on me. 
Now, being from New York, some of my examples draw on the Northeast. So please forgive me for that. The first cultural complex I want to look at is lacrosse. It was created by the indigenous peoples of North America and is referred to as the creator's game. Not all, expector, uh, not all experts agree on the origins of the game, although many look to the Iroquois of the Northern New York State as the creators. But it's not just a game, it's part of a healing process. It was used to settle disputes. It nurtures their spiritual development and help them prepare for war. It taught a valuable lesson that everyone has struggles and opponents. The key to, sur key to survival is friends and allies. The game was so integral to their culture that at some point in history, the nations of the Iroquois Confederacy actually buried their players lacrosse sticks with them. The second cultural complex that I'd like to look at is our government, which was influenced by the Iroquois Confederacy, which is made up of six nations. They are the oldest living participatory democracy on earth. Many of their democratic principles were incorporated into the constitution. Benjamin Franklin was one of the main supporters of incorporating the Iroquois system into the new democracy. According to Cynthia Feathers and Susan Feathers, in 1775, Iroquois representatives were invited to attend the Continental Congress where the treaty commissioners met with the chiefs of the Six Nations. During the debates over the plan for the Union, Franklin, think of states here, pointed to the strength of the Iroquois Confederacy and stressed the fact that the individual nations of the Confederacy maintained internal sovereignty, managing their own internal affairs without interference from the Grand Council. Two examples of the Iroquois governing body that were incorporated into our government are two branches of the legislature with procedures for passing laws and creating a balance of power between the Iroquois Confederacy and the individual nations. And on a side note, if you've seen the emblem of the American Eagle holding 13 arrows, that also came from the Iroquois. They used six arrows, which was symbolic of how the six nations were stronger together than one on its own. The 13 arrows of the American Eagle represent the 13 colonies. The third cultural complex I would like to look at is spirituality. Worcester College published a brief comparison of some of the foundations of Christianity versus indigenous spirituality. The first comparison states that in Christianity, human beings have a special status. They are the only beings created in God's image, and so they are the only sacred things in creation. It follows that the rest of creation is there only for human domination and for fulfilling the needs and wishes of humankind. Whereas many indigenous cultures believe that humans are not elevated above other beings. Humans are simply one of many beings, all of them inspirited, all of them sacred, including plants. Here is an awareness of a community of interdependent beings needing the other, each with a role to play. The second comparison states that in Christianity, nature has fallen, it is disordered, and so stands as an enemy to human purposes. Humans are called to tame the wilderness and in the vocation of modern science are called to understand all aspects of creation so that we can better control it for our purposes. Whereas many indigenous cultures or believe that it is not the role of human beings to control nature for human purposes, but rather the challenge for humans is to find their proper place in the natural community. Persons are not expected not to dominate, but to live in harmony with the rest of creation. It is perceived as having a natural goodness about it, which is honored in rituals and prayers that offer thanks for the beauty and generosity of the natural world and its creator. The last comparison states that in Christianity, salvation is individual, not collective. 
So the individual's destiny is disconnected from that of their community, resulting in a radical individualism. So now globally dominant Western paradigm is one based upon competition, power, and control, and is perceived in predominantly masculine terms. Whereas many indigenous cultures focus on the community and not the individual, the individual's identity resides in the community and in the individual and the individual finds fulfillment in serving the community. The most admired is not the one who accumulates the most, but the one who gives the most back to the community. Someone summed these differences for me in a very simple way. Indigenous peoples see themselves as connected to everything that has energy. That could be to other individuals, to your committee as a, community as a whole, or to the natural environment. It is a holistic approach to living a balanced life. Now, we'd like you to enjoy I Wish You Peace by an Iroquois man from upstate New York. Skana go aga, skana go aga, how we how we nega in our ya ya. Skana go Skana go aga, ana ye, ana yo. Skana go aga, skana go aga. Se go, skana go aga. Gonna go aga, we are we nega and now ya ya. Say go, gonna go aga. Gonna go aga, how we are we nega and now ya ya. Ana ye, ana yo. Gonna go aga, gonna go aga, ana ye, ana yo. Gonna go aga, gonna go aga. Now, just as we called the directions at the beginning of the service, we want to thank the powers of each direction for being with us today. Ordinarily, uh, the spirits enjoy smoke as a treat, but today I'm hoping that they are sated by all the smoke we've had around us. Powers of the center, Kichaba Ninhahata, creator God of the Rapaho. Thank you for being with us this morning. Powers of the West, Coyote, creator God of the Miwok people. Thank you for being with us this morning. Powers of the North, Nguta, Creator God of the Inuit, thank you for being with us this morning. Powers of the East, 
Roeno, creator God of the Iroquois, thank you for being with us this morning. Powers of the South, Nanishta, creator God of the Choctaw, thank you for being with us this morning. We will now extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame by not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And our postlude will be Emma's revolution, keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. Sigamos adelante. Siempre adelante, siempre adelante, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Gonna keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly. Keep on loving boldly, never turning back, never turning back. Amaremos con pasión, siempre con pasión, siempre con pasión.
Okay, now I believe Laurel has some announcements for us and then we will break out into our virtual coffee rooms. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Francie. That was a great service, a real eye opener, I think for all of us. And also excellent suggestions or selections for the videos. And I want you all to know that that is one of the silver linings of this COVID isolation is that we have been able to explore beyond our live music offerings. And something that's very exciting is that when we get back into our sanctuary, we have now two screens in our sanctuary that will allow us the capacity to continue to have some of these YouTube videos that are just such gems. Um, yesterday was pretty awful and I thank Kathy for taking in Elaine and Elizabeth, I know you're with a friend, so thank your friend for us for housing you. And we did send out an email to everyone yesterday that if you need help, please let us know. So the pastoral care team or the church phone will be your lifeline if you need some support from our community. Um, as you know, the election is coming up and our social justice ministry has taken positions on three ballot measures and asks for your support. Proposition 116, vote no, because it would reduce state income tax. And while it might sound good, it would reduce state revenue impacting education, transportation, and healthcare programs in an already strapped state budget. So vote no on Prop 116. Also vote no on Prop 117 because this measure would require the use of tax revenue to pay for services that would otherwise be funded through user fees. So no on 117, but yes on 118. Prop 118 would create a paid family and medical leave program. COVID has shown but one example of the need for flexible paid family leave. So for those of you who haven't voted yet, please vote yes on 118. So these social justice ministry positions match the positions taken by Together Colorado, which is a statewide multi-denominational social action organization and Namaqua is a member of Together Colorado. So if you have any questions, please contact Cheryl Grice, who is our social justice chair or Doug Stewart, who is our board president and also involved in Together Colorado. Also, I just heard from Lenny Boren that her husband, Dr. Bill Parton, and our own Dr. Jim Danforth will discuss climate change and health tomorrow night at 6.30 at the AAUW Loveland October meeting. So if any of you are interested in attending that, you could probably go to their website, or if you have questions, you can contact Lenny Boren, or I also have the information. And then finally, next week is our annual Dia de los Muertos service. And because of needing to adapt to not being able to gather together to create an altar in our sanctuary, Jan and Wright, our Director of Religious Education and I will be on our side lawn next Saturday morning. I think it's gonna be a little chilly and it may even be a little wet, but I hope that some of you will come and bring photos or mementos to help build our altar, which then will be filmed and shown during our Sunday service. So Dia de los Muertos celebrates the spirits of those who have gone before us. And so every year we have this tradition and we're once again, hoping that we can adapt to these unique and challenging times. So thank you everyone for coming today. It was so great to see Milo and Cora and I hope Max is doing well and all our other kids. So now I guess, um, We'll go into our virtual coffee hour, into our breakout rooms. So thanks, Chad, for being our Zoomer today. And thanks again, Elizabeth and Francie.
Chad, can you hear me? This is Trish.
So how you doing? Uh, <laughs> Bye everyone. Have a good week. Hello, Hannah, Hannah, are you okay? Is she still there? Where's Hannah? Do you still there? Where's Hannah? Am I here? I'm here. You're still pregnant. I'm here. Yeah. Is, so 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 soon. soon. Yeah. I'm Any day now. Here. Hi, Hannah. Yeah. She's due tomorrow, so we're, wow. we're crossing our fingers that she'll come soon. So, Armin, me, can't wait. Well, best of luck to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We love you guys. <laughs> we love you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care. Okay.